Welcome back to the Warbird Mistress. This is episode three of the series Luftwaffe at Sea, and this is the episode Opening Moves. This is going to be a two-part episode because as we've gone into now the war, we want to look at both how the Luftwaffe was organizationally arranged and operationally employed, as well as some of the new inventory items that we have in stock. So right now we're going to be seeing a lot more of the land-based aircraft becoming important. We're going to see a lot of really very little changes where the float planes and other infantry are concerned. Because by now, models like the AR-196 and Heinkel-115, they were well integrated into the Luftwaffe. And Goering wasn't exactly interested in seaborne activities. So even when they needed really good maritime aircraft in the Bay of Biscay, the North Sea, the Mediterranean, it's not really important to him. So we're going to begin with some of the new additions to the inventory, some of which are brand new, some only theoretical maritime assets, and some are developments of well-known existing models that would serve well. In the next video, you can expect an in-depth survey of how Luftwaffe maritime operations were organized and made manifest, including three-dimensional warfare, early maritime operations, and the different types of units that were dedicated to maritime purposes. That includes a serious look at the air sea rescue services and even pilot training. So with that being said, let's get on with the show. Beginning with float planes and coastal scout aircraft as usual, let's look at the Dornier DO-22. And this was unique in being one of the new float planes that Luftwaffe found in her hands after the Yugoslavia and Greece campaigns, which there's videos on those too, so check those out. And while only about 30 were built, there's a great irony in the whole situation that a German aircraft designed by their Swiss subsidiary using French engines serving in Finnish, Greek, and Yugoslav services once again coming into German hands and then into Finnish hands. So the Germans didn't really hold on to the few that were seized at the outbreak of the war for long. They were, together with the captured examples, uh, passed out to other German allies. Four examples that had been meant for Latvia, uh, four captured in Yugoslavia. Uh, they were quickly passed on to the Ilma Voimat, and there they served with the original floats, as well as with skis for the Arctic. The Greeks scuttled some of their examples before they could be captured, uh, but the Yugoslavs, the other eight of them, fought with the free Yugoslav forces in the Mediterranean. And, you know, this is a... a what do you want to say? It? This is definitely a interesting thing that you see it flying with allied aircraft. So, you know, this little Hispano Suiza 12 YBRS powered uh, power sole float wing float plane was not exactly a miracle of design, but it was definitely an Axis uh, aircraft in service. And it shows off some of what the German interwar designs were going towards as war broke out. Um, plus, it's just a plain interesting aircraft to me. So there's my tuppence. Now on to the Fisla V-167, which I know uh, was mentioned as something belonging in the last episode, and probably does. But uh, first flown in 1937, and only 14 examples were built between 1938 and 1940. It wasn't a, you know, any ever real production aircraft. She had been intended to be used on the Kloft Zeppelin, and of course I discuss her in detail in that video. I was supposed to have a low maximum speed, stable handling characteristics. It was not meant to be a performance aircraft, really. It was armed with a machine gun in the front, another in the rear, either a single 500 or 1,000 pound bomb, a single torpedo, or a load of 410 pound bombs. Flew at 202 miles an hour, cruised at 160, had a range of actually 810 miles or 930 with a drop tank, so it, could, it did have... Uh, endurance on its side, if not anything else. In fact, if not for the light construction, she would probably have made a great coastal anti-shipping aircraft. She was 30 miles an hour faster than the Stuka, had longer range, had a heavier bomb load, the max speed was only 8 miles an hour slower. Uh, the few in service were based in the Netherlands as part of Erpolbungsklota 167, and then they were used uh, to train, I believe, a uh, couple of pilots in coastal aviation. They were mostly all then sent to landing gear testing facilities in Budweis in Bohemia. 
eventually they made their way onto the uh, ZMDH, the Zrakoplostvo uh, Nezavizne Trnavse Hvratsky, if I got that right. Uh, that was the Croatian State's Air Force. And it was there in September of 44 that one actually critically injured a British Mustang. The damage was sufficient to force the aircraft uh, to crash land, and it was likely the last biplane air-to-air -air victory. But that's really all that there is to say about her, because as I said, check out my Graf Zeppelin video if you haven't. It goes into much further detail there. But another lightly built aircraft with a unique purpose was the Rado AR-231. The unusual number here was made to be launched from a U-boat. She doesn't look normal because her design was not meant to be normal. The asymmetrical wings were supposed to be folded into a neat little package. The, uh, really, I mean that. Sorry if it sounded sarcastic. And sorry for the Simpsons reference. Now, six of these were built. They were poorly powered with an inverted inline six-cylinder. Uh, it was a Heert HM501. And the top speed was only 110 miles an hour. She could cruise at 81 miles an hour, but for only four hours. And this was something that even great war machines were capable of doing. Early great war machines. The Luftwaffe didn't really go far with her. Uh, she, they focused instead on rotary wings. Uh, although two of these, you know, I guess you want to call them uh, collapsible tchotchkes. They did serve aboard the auxiliary cruiser Stier, uh, known as Raider J to the British. So she actually did see service in what could be considered uh, behind enemy lines, if not the front line. And with that, we move on to flying boats. And it's in flying boats that we see some really interesting stuff. Uh, of course, the Germans are known for having huge flying boats, but they weren't really as important as their fame might lead some to believe. Now, the Blauman Voss 222, which was originally the HA-222, was perhaps one of the best-known flying boats of the war. Again, only a small number were made, only 13. And it was not a military design. It was designed by Richard Vogt for Lufthansa uh, to meet a long-range passenger and mail aircraft contract. She just turned out to be faster than most of her competitors, uh, let alone at her incomparable size. Uh, it was Her performance was excellent. Now, she could carry 92 passengers or 72 patients with their attendants, a top speed of 240 miles an hour, which is nothing to laugh at. She had a flat deck that facilitated easier loading and unloading with this huge hatch on the starboard side of after the wing route. She just really didn't have a bad side to her design at all. Um, she was innovative, she was user-friendly, and... You know, she was even easy to maintain with a huge wing with plenty of access points, uh, both internally and externally. Now, her balance floats are something that I think are overlooked way too often. Her balance floats were, I, I guess you say, like a butterfly's wing. Uh, some people say clamshell, but uh, they folded flush into the wing during flight, but when they deployed, they came together like butterfly's wings. So... They were technically four floats with a clamshell design, and as each one would descend, they would fold together seamlessly. And this would save on space and reduce drag. Unfortunately, there, I don't really find much film of anything of that sort because it's during the landing and takeoff operations that probably weren't what filmmakers were looking for. But regardless, uh, her tremendous range made her invaluable. She could fly out as far as Alexandra Land and the Svalbard Archipelago, and she served there to evacuate indirectly ill weather station crew. Uh, in fact, if I remember correctly, they had eaten raw meat, and only the uh, only the medic who happened to be a vegetarian escaped being sick. Anyway, they flew out an FW two hundred Condor that was supposed to drop supplies and a doctor. It crash landed, so they took the BB two twenty two. Flew that out there with the repair parts, since no other aircraft could lift that much and go that far and land at sea. Uh, so after she dropped off all the parts, the Condor actually flew out of there uh, under her own power and landed in Narvik, or Trondheim, Trondheim, I believe. Anyway, the uh, 222 was armed with a 20mm cannon 
in three positions, the forward turret as well as wing turrets, both starboard and port. And she had five 13mm guns uh, that were in the nose and four beam positions. But it was not really even in the air that she was vulnerable. She flew at very low altitude, uh, especially in the Mediterranean. She was hardly ever intercepted, and she would meet her end at anchor. Uh, mostly, I think it was Tempest Mustangs, and I can't remember what else it was, but they were, they were caught in harbor, and that's how they were destroyed, for the most part. Uh, she actually did see post-war service with uh, Arctic expeditions, if I remember correctly. But anyway, uh, her potential use, though, was always on the minds of Luftwaffe commanders who saw her as you know, this great way to reach long-distance targets. They even thought of connecting Germany and Japan using her. Uh, she ran high-volume and high-value supply missions, both in the Med and on the Eastern Front. But at the end of the war, especially after the fall of North Africa and when the Eastern and Arctic fronts turned against Germany, she just didn't really have a use. There, uh, there was really nothing to her. So you have this great aircraft with a 28-hour endurance, cruising at low altitude at 190 miles an hour, mind you. And there was just no way to employ that. And what amazes me is that it was all done with only six engines. She had uh, six Junkers Yumo 207C six-cylinder diesels and did it all on that. But in the end, she just didn't really find a role in a war that turned so quickly against Germany that she had no place to be. Now, another civil design that was put to military use uh, was the Dornier DO-26, which also got its start as a you know, civilian aircraft, it, but in passenger and mail across the Atlantic. Half dozen were built, and they were designed originally to go from Lisbon to New York. Uh, it was... One of the things, though, that the United States fought against. the, uh, And I can imagine why. Pan Am kind of had their way of things. And Lufthansa wasn't about to go encroaching where one trip was. So she ended up instead flying mail in the South Atlantic route between Bathurst in the Gambia and Natal in Brazil. The three that served with Lufthansa were named Zayadla, Zayfalka, and Zaymova. That's... Uh, Sea Snake, Sea Falcon, and the Seagull. And then another three were made, uh, put directly into military service. As a transport, uh, the small gold-winged aircraft saw action in Norway. Uh, one of them was shot down by a SKUA of 803 Squadron while taking a platoon of Gebirgsjäger to Narvik. Uh, so that you know, it was a vulnerable aircraft, we should say. And the other two pre-war examples were also lost in the Norwegian campaign, but they were sunk at anchor. Unfortunately, when they were sunk, they had mountain howitzers that the Dils uh, Jäger definitely needed. But uh, they were discovered by hurricanes of 4-6 squadron at uh, Rombaksfjord outside Narvik, and that was the end of them. Of the other three examples, the uh, V-5 was lost in a failed catapult launch off the Friesenland. Uh, that was off the coast of Brest. And I covered the catapult, catapult ships in the last episode, so you can always go check that out. Then the other two just kind of disappeared into the fog. They lived out the war in ignominy as part of the uh, Erpobungstelle in uh, Trevemunde. And that was it. They, uh, they didn't really have a place to be either. And now we go into more famous aircraft. And I mean that in the sense that these are versions of well-known land-based aircraft that happen to serve well at sea, or at least serve at sea. And we'll start with the, Deer, the uh, Dornier DO-17E. And again, I don't want to spend a lot of time with the flying pencil here. Her use as a maritime plane is minimal, but it's worth mentioning. And this is especially so when it comes to the DO-17E, which was the model used in Spain, and you know, she was easily intercepted. Her performance was not what they expected it to be. And of course, the Z was the main variant uh, during the war. Her speed was only 210 miles an hour, but in a light dive, she could reach 310. She was stable in a light dive, and her cruise bombing skills were deadly accurate. So... 
in a shallow dive that was both safe and accurate against a moving target at sea. She could be a good aircraft, but she really didn't see much service at all in the war except for in reconnaissance and patrol. Uh, they were basically out of service after Norway, but she did provide the framework for the Dornier 217, which was designed to be an excellent anti-shipping platform. And a lot of what was learned through her went into other variants that did see service at sea. Uh, of course, the 17Z had innumerable variants, so that's something we'll get into later. But first, let's look at the Heinkel 111. This is nothing new to Warbird fans, I think. You show somebody a picture of a Heinkel 111, even somebody that's not into aviation history, they might say, that's a German bomber. It's, you know, definitely one of the more famous aircraft in history. But today we're looking at the 111H6. Uh, this was a variant that definitely was meant for maritime use, and it deserves a place here. Not to say that others didn't. The H5 was capable of carrying mines, and any variant could, of course, drop conventional bombs at sea, but it was the H6 that was this move forward in design and towards being a anti-shipping strike aircraft. The uh, 1350 horsepower Junkers Yumo 211F1 engines, they increase speed at cruising altitude and at low altitude. The 111 did not have great low altitude performance before. Uh, the variant had an increased defensive armament with a 20 millimeter cannon uh, improved machine gun positions, a heavier bomb load. She carried internal and external loads. And what made her really unique was that external load because the H-6 was designed to serve as a torpedo bomber, especially in the Mediterranean and the Arctic. This variant made a deadly name for herself and the pair of torpedoes she carried. Uh, issues with German torpedoes aside, one of the most famous convoys of the war, PQ-17, they found out about uh, the 111H6 the hard way when 25 of them from Kampfgeschwader Sachsenzwanzig uh, descended on them and just went right through the defensive screen, sunk a number of vessels, uh, caused, in fact, the destroyers to scatter. And, of course, that was just the beginning of PQ-17's hardships. Uh, but it wasn't expected. You know, you have 25 aircraft, that's 50 torpedoes. Now, the Betty... The uh, Savoya Marchetti SM-79 and a couple other aircraft carried twin torpedoes, but it just makes you that much uh, deadlier if you do strike a hit. You don't strike once, you strike twice. And in fact, the Red Navy, which we don't, I don't think anybody really talks a lot about uh, at all, uh, they would definitely suffer at the hands of the Heinkels as well. Uh, they would, or during the war, they basically turned to night operations to avoid interception. But a torpedo-armed 111 was definitely something they did not want to see. And uh, after operating in North Africa, well, I should say over North Africa, the, the 111 was just this excellent interdiction and anti-shipping platform uh, in the minds of everyone. She, I mean, she sunk many ships in the convoys to Malta. Uh, the problem was is that there weren't that many of her. Uh, she would end up being replaced by the U-88 by the summer of 1943, and it was all due to attrition and mechanical stress. She was difficult to intercept, especially when traveling at low altitude, uh, below radar, definitely. Uh, but her effectiveness was really limited by the fact that they didn't invest more in numbers. And with the sheer variety of Heinkels around, it probably would have been difficult to supply spare parts in any severe number either. And with that, we look at the Heinkel 117. And <laughs> it's something I don't really want to dwell on either because she could be an episode in herself. And you know, her troubled development, the design flaws, it was the whole politics around her were just, they were, there's a whole episode waiting for the HE 177. But as much as people focus on her being a strategic bomber, or even an interceptor in a bizarre uh, historical note. It's actually worth noting that she was designed to be able to dive bomb, and she couldn't. But she did have excellent glide bombing performance, and with that, combined with a long range, she became a valuable maritime asset. 
they flew her out of the Biscay coast in Bretagne, and she could reach far out into the Atlantic. And she could not only just fly out in search of convoys, she could find them, track them, and even attack them if the situation called for it. Furthermore, there was a dozen or so of them that were turned into the A1, U2, uh, variant, and these aren't the interceptors that were used against the uh, Allied heavy bombers over Europe. These were designed to be interceptors against Allied patrol aircraft at sea. Your Sunderlands, your Liberators, all of these. Uh, she had an enlarged gondola, or a bola, as the Germans called it, that stored a pair of 30 millimeter MK-101 cannon. So, you know, although she was not known for her service at sea, she was a valuable asset, and when she was available and functioning properly, she did her job. I mean, you can only imagine you know, being in a flying boat out in the middle of nowhere, let's say the flying porcupine herself, the Sunderland, and all of a sudden you see another he heavy aircraft. It's a 177. You think, well, they might try to shoot you down. They might not, but it's only machine guns versus machine guns. And all of a sudden you've got dual 30 millimeter cannon tearing into your fuselage. It's I should, probably should have looked up if that ever happened or not before I didn't mention that, but either way, it's just something that in my head was struck me as almost ingenious and frightening if you're on the other side. And last but not least, there's one uh, single example that really should be uh, mentioned. It was an A5. Uh, she had the uh, Stammkenzeichen of KM uh, TB. This was the test bed aircraft for the Funkerhe 200, the uh, Hondfeld aircraft uh, mounted air to surface maritime patrol radar. Now the Hondfeld we were definitely going to talk about uh but it was used by great success by the Luftwaffe aboard many different platforms but it was the HE177A5 that was used for, to initially test the aircraft operate uh, test the uh, radar operationally and you know, see what they could do with it. Uh, now back to, say, a patrol aircraft with civil aviation origins, which the 177 definitely was not, we get to the Junkers U-90. I mentioned how the U-89 was a complete failure in the last episode, uh, but this is going a development of her that actually turned into something legitimate. The U-90, uh, there were 18 of them made, and she was created initially for an e uh, April 1939 request from the uh, Luxfahrtministerium to be translated into military use. Now, the military variant was structurally different. So you're looking at you know, the civil variants that were put into use and then those following April 1939 that were built for military use. Uh, her wing was enlarged by over 10%. It had a, a straighter leading edge than the uh, civilian models. She had this electrically powered loading ramp that would actually lift the tail of the aircraft to a horizontal plane. So it kind of facilitated loading and unloading cargo in a flying position that made it much more efficient. Instead of you know, pushing everything uphill, they saw service as transports mostly, but they were also useful maritime patrol aircraft. They flew around 240 miles an hour thanks to upgraded engines. They had an operational radius when unloaded of nearly 700 miles. And she had a slow landing speed of only 70 miles per hour, which not only meant that these coastal grass airfields in France could handle her, especially if they gave her uh, you know, the almost cartoonish wheels that were designed for grass airfields at the time. Uh, but she could also be you know, a valuable loitering aircraft because her stall speed was so slow. She cruised at 200 miles an hour, but when it came to, you know, hanging around something that you spot, that loitering uh, capability is really important. But her most important role, in all seriousness, though, is that she was a step towards the U-290 and U-390 designs. And as long as we're talking about steps towards things, we're going to take couple from the staircase we built in the last episode and added here. We discussed the Blomenfoss uh, HA-140 and 139. So now we get to another variant of the 139, and this was the HA-142, which I have seen it marked as the uh, Beifau 142, but 
mostly she should be referred to as HA. She was a land-based aircraft, uh, development of the 139, as I mentioned. She had a strengthened wing that had this hollow cross girder that acted as a fuel tank. So she actually gained strength uh, from the added fuel and from the construction of the girder that was used to hold it. Uh, not the first time in aviation history that that happens, and you know won't be the last, but just one of those neat things that you, you see a company evolving over time. Anyway, only four were ever built. Uh, they never saw civilian service. They were designed originally as a mail liner, but that never happened. The first two prototypes were converted to long-range maritime patrol aircraft. They had a dorsal turret, uh, defensive nose and beam positions, of course, radios, navigation, etc. A tiny bomb bay, and they were given a glazed nose and a gondola. Uh, not unlike the uh, mid to late variants of the Heinkel 111. Albeit, in their case, it was a ventral gondola set further abaft. Now, they were based in France and used for maritime patrol. There were plans to use them as torpedo bombers, especially later when they had guided torpedoes. But there was little effective contribution for her to make. And she had a huge range. I mean, she had a range of almost 2,400 miles. But her moderate top speed of 230 miles an hour, her bomb load was only 880 pounds max. And that would cut her range by over half. You look at it in four... The four 220-pound bombs in an aircraft with only rudimentary sighting capability and flight characteristics that made her slow and steady, the shoes would have been a sitting duck to Allied aircraft gunners and uh, let alone interceptors. It just wasn't enough to justify her existence. Now, the third and fourth prototypes, they served as forces insertion aircraft, and they were not really significantly changed from their civilian design. So that's more important that we look at the first two examples than the last two, but it's really all there is to say about her. And with that, we move to a name that we really don't hear that often at sea, and that's Messerschmitt. Uh, we're looking at the Messerschmitt 261, of which three were produced. It wasn't quite a derivative of the BF-110, although some people think it was. Uh, really, she went back to the 110's roots in the 161 and 162 projects. Those were... Uh, Recon and light bomber projects, respectively. And the intent was actually to create a propaganda aircraft. She was supposed to be sleek, fast, lightweight, and carry a single payload, the Olympic Flame. That was her entire purpose when she was designed, was to carry the Olympic torch from Germany to Japan for the 1940 Summer Olympics. And, of course, it was never happened, but it appealed to the Fuhrer, uh, his favor led to the nickname, actually, of the Adolfina. Uh, but, of course, that flight, as I said, never happened. They finished three of them. Uh, two of them would actually end up seeing some military service, but only in a test capacity. So you see that she had two nacelles, but she actually had four DB-601 engines. Uh, they were linked in what was known as the DB-606, which, of course, the uh, Heinkel 177 is infamous for. You know, these linked power sources and... The 261's design, though, allowed for much easier maintenance of them, and it prevented overheating. She had a top speed of just about 400 miles an hour at cruising altitude, a range of 7,000 miles. Her, her endurance potential was you know, just ideal for a maritime recon platform. But again, she wasn't really designed for production. And unless you're gearing a company up to produce a lot of aircraft, they're not going to have a significant role. Uh, she was considered as a possibility to put into production. Uh, Carl Bauer took her out uh, for test flights, had endurance records that were even met over the Atlantic. But, you know, besides testing her metal, she really never made an operational flight as far as anyone can tell. And it came to nothing. Two of them ended up being destroyed in bombing raids, and the third I was just used as a testbed aircraft. She never even came close to being used operationally. And with that, I'm ending operationally. Uh, once again, I'm sorry if I sound a little congested or anything, but yeah, you know, it's I definitely want to get this one out there, and it is a topic that I love. As I mentioned, I did find the script to Wings of the Coast Guard, which I thought I had uh, accidentally deleted. But uh, really getting to the heart of it, this is a two-part episode, as I mentioned. 
So we've covered the infantry of the opening moves, what's new to the Luftwaffe. Of course, they carried over what they had already, uh, from which we covered in the other videos. The next one, we're going to look at how that infantry was employed. You know, we have three-dimensional air subsurface operations to cover, uh, Fall Vikingers Folly, and just the organization of Aviation Command. Uh, now, actually, I shouldn't say Aviation Command, but how av maritime aviation units functioned. Now, in the Luftwaffe versus Kriegsmarine video, I kind of went into the high command intrigue and how orders were supposed to be followed, how they were, you know, what their origin was supposed to be. I'm not going to do that. Uh, this is really just the practical squadron uh, level kind of things. These are not going to be you know, anything more than that. I'm not getting into the politics of it all, just who did what with what and how well did they do it. But it does allow us also to cover some of the really interesting stuff that was out there for maritime aviation. Uh, the uh, Vetekulskluppe, the, the the weather recon units the that were dedicated to maritime purposes, the training units for maritime pilots, the and it was all you know, very dedicated to training men for service over the water. So we'll get to that in the next one, from training to patrol to weather, all of it. And bombing too, it's all coming up in the second part of Luftwaffe at Sea, opening moves. So stay tuned, and as always, a heartfelt thank you to uh, all of my sponsors. You know, this is you know, something that I put a lot of effort into, and I'm so grateful that you know, people out there have decided to contribute. And uh, as I said, I did reduce my working hours a little bit less, so... You're going to be seeing more videos, and I hope you stay tuned for them. Share, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Uh, there's something called a super like that I think I agreed to, and I'm, honestly, I'm not even sure what it is. Uh, but whatever it is, yeah, I'm thankful for your appreciation and for everything you say in the comments to each other and getting those conversations going. My name is Claire, and I am the Warbird Mistress. And I'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.